What's up everybody, welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explain, we'll be looking at the social media mystery thriller Searching, where a father desperately uses every aspect of the internet to find out what happened to his missing daughter. In the vein of the unfriended movies, Searching takes place entirely from the perspective of a computer's desktop. However, where the unfriended film's take on social media and technology felt very basic and unrealistic, Searching captures this idea much more successfully and accurately than any film in the growing genre of screen-based movies. Producer Timor, not even going to try to pronounce his last name, is the mastermind behind this format, having been a producer on the Unfriended films as well. He's convinced this format is worthy of its own genre, as these computer-based movies reflect our tech-based society. So he created his own proprietary screen recording software, ScreenLife, to capture the film's story via the computer's desktop that we never leave. And while it appears to be visually quite simple to construct, Searching actually took one and a half years of editing, showing how difficult it actually is to accurately recreate the day-to-day -day interaction we have with technology. While the way the movie is presented is well done and quite engaging, along with an impressive performance from our lead, John Cho, unfortunately, the story itself doesn't quite gel. Regardless, the movie has a lot to appreciate, giving us a thrilling screen-based ride for much of its screen time only in the final act really falling apart. So let's check out Searching, breaking down the story, its many twists, and explaining the ending. I have to say the opening sequence of Searching is enough to convince me that there is something to this whole burgeoning genre, and it's able to creatively give the audience information, as well as build emotions entirely via a screen. Starting on an empty Windows desktop with the creation of two accounts, David and then Pamela Kim, the beginning of the new family's computer. From here, we then continue over the span of several years as more notifications and videos pop up, focusing on the birth and growth of Margot into adolescence, as well as her mother's tragic spread of cancer that eventually takes her life. All of this story is presented via an assortment of different screen-based means, mundane videos of the family baking, dates of Pam coming back from the hospital that keep getting pushed back and eventually deleted, pictures together of the family on Margot's first day of each grade as she grows up, which becomes much more somber when Margot begins high school, and this time it's only her and her father together. Even if this whole sequence is most certainly cheap sentimentality and cribbed straight from the opening of Up, this sequence is still surprisingly effective at evoking emotions entirely through screen-based means. The mother's death unfolding entirely through these chosen moments and memories expressed on screen, telling us the backstory in a creative and unique way. Even something as subtle as when David later logs into Pam's account Account, we see a notification it's been 692 days since you last logged in, saying quite a lot with a little pop-up. When we pick up in present day, the death of Pam still lingers heavily over David and Margot's father-daughter relationship, the two doing their best to move on but never actually addressing what happened. At one point when the two are chatting, David begins to respond with your mother would be proud too, but stops himself and deletes the message before sending it, as though even mentioning her is too much for them to bear emotionally, though they do appear very close and share a strong bond, seen in their joking and warm initial interaction, while Margot is at a study session which he tells him will last all night long. David has no reason to question Margot, still under the impression that she is being honest with him, but soon realizes how wrong he is, when Margot calls him several times in the middle of the night, which he misses due to being asleep, and the next day is unable to get a hold of her. But that's just how teens are, you know? So he only really becomes concerned when noticing she left her laptop behind, because how could she survive without that. And now, legitimately concerned, files a missing persons report with the police, teaming up with the seeming super cop Detective Vic. She relates his missing Margot to her own difficult child Charlie, recounting a story of when he went door to door collecting donations for a fake charity. But when Vic discovered this ruse, rather than punishing him, said that she founded the charity herself, all to cover her own son's wrongdoings, showing just how far she's willing to go to protect him. And even with Vic's help, it's David that does most of the real investigating, and it's through Margot's laptop that he begins to peel back the layers of her life, and unraveling what he thought he knew about her. People who he believed to be her friends admit they don't really know much about her beyond being a loner, and the girl whose house had the study group at says the only reason they invited her was because she's trying to get into Berkeley. Some friend! There's a brief moment of relief when he speaks to another kid's mom, learning that Margot was invited to go camping with him, but when they returned, the boy said she never showed up, and that he only 
asked her to join them because his mom made him, as she was close with Pam. Already, his understanding of his daughter is brought into question, and as he continues his way through the rest of Margot's friends on Facebook, it seems none of these people knew her either. Looking into Margot's most visited websites, he learns that she had been live streaming frequently over the web. And it's all pretty typical stuff of a teenager just sitting there not even saying anything. Quality content. Going through the recorded archives of the streams, David sees the same user popping up in every one. What appears to be a young redheaded woman with the username Fish and Chips, all of which sounds incredibly suspicious. It's here that the story takes on another interesting layer, as the world at large becomes invested in Margot's story, flooding the news and all forms of social media. The scope and perspective of the story shifts, and suddenly David finds he is now a part of the story that has captured the world's attention, which as everyone gets more wrapped up in things, even suspect him of taking Margot, as the story balloons in popularity and spirals into a much larger public view. And all those friends that weren't really her friends suddenly change their tune, posting heartfelt messages about how much Margot meant to them, essentially taking advantage of the media fervor to enhance their own social media presence, which works well even if it is more than a bit unseemly. When watching this part, I couldn't help but consider that this has a strangely real-life parallel in the recent case of the missing Molly Tibbetts, as around the world people hoped she would be found as each clue or lead was released. And similarly to in the movie, her death was used as fodder for others, in particular politicians to support their own agendas. And I'm not going to get into any more of that other than to say it's unsettling in and of itself. And the strange parallel to this real life case in the movies was hard to deny. And it's impressive that the movie was able to mirror something that accurately that reflects how our own society reacts to cases like this. Okay, sorry about that. Back to the story. As David continues being twisted and turned by each new piece of information that comes to light, at one point even suspecting his brother of being involved, he learns that Vic has found the man that confesses to killing his daughter, who also left behind a video confession before taking his life. Convenient! At this point, David is heartbroken, as it appears that all hope is lost for Margot, until a new clue sends David to discovering what really happened. When setting up an online webcast of his daughter's funeral, for some reason, a reply window includes a stock photograph of a woman, the same woman seen in the fish and chips profile picture, and after some quick searching, learns that that picture as well as the profile picture are actually of a stock photo model and not of a teenage girl. And David understands whoever Margot was chatting with was definitely not who they were letting on. Obviously, Margot was the victim of catfishing, but who is behind it and what is their motivation? Looking back at photos of Detective Vic, working at a volunteer program for reformed criminals, she sees her along with the man that was pegged as Margot's killer, making it obvious the two knew each other before the case. So it was actually Vic that set up this former criminal, got him to confess and killed him in order to keep David away from the truth. But now that David has figured out she was behind the cover up, the truth is out and she is arrested at the funeral, and at the police station gives a very matter-of-fact, straightforward confession of exactly what happened in excruciating detail. The person behind the fake fish and chips persona is actually her son Charlie, who we already know from his previous charity scam, his mother will do anything to protect, and this time has taken her mother's love to the absolute limit corrupting the search for Margot to hopefully keep her son out of trouble. It turns out that Charlie, who has some unspecified mental issues, is a classmate of Margot's and has had an unrequited crush on her since middle school. So in order to get closer with her, created the fish and chips female persona so she would be willing to talk to him. Part of Charlie's made up persona was that his mother has cancer, obviously to appeal to Margot's own situation, and says they can't afford the bills for her treatment. So Margot, who had been keeping the money from her piano lessons after quitting them in secret months ago, naively transfers Charlie the tidy sum of 2500 bucks, believing she is helping out her new friend. Though after getting the money, Charlie began to feel guilty over taking it under false pretenses, pretty much scamming this girl he actually likes, and sets up a meeting in person to hopefully set things straight and give her the money back. This takes us to the night that Margot went missing, where the two were set to meet up. But since it was Charlie and not who she thought it was going to be, was confused and attacked him, fleeing into the woods, leading to a chase and fight between them, resulting in Charlie accidentally Accidentally or not, pushing Margot off the side of a cliff. So with this new twist in the case, the media goes into a frenzy as the search is renewed for Margot. Now that her fate is up in the air once again, and luckily thanks to a recent rainstorm, she managed to survive for a week stuck at the bottom of a ravine this whole time. And this area was never previously searched as Vic made sure it wasn't even from the initial search, as well as many other steps of sabotaging, including getting rid of Margot's car in a lake. As expected, Vic takes total responsibility for everything, 
But of course, her son still gets implicated in the crimes. And with Margot rescued, she and David now have a more open relationship. And it's thanks to this that Margot has returned to her love of playing piano, something she couldn't do after her mother's death, seen applying for school at a music conservatory. And this time, when typing that Mob would be proud too, David doesn't delete it and sends it, showing us that they finally have addressed that trauma in their family. And at least now the two have each other and are no longer hiding their emotions with each other. Losing Margot has taught David just how important she truly is and won't let difficult emotions get in the way of their relationship any longer. So in a way, it's kind of a good thing that this all happened. The end result of what we learn about what was behind Margot's disappearance feels pretty straightforward and cliche. The motive and conclusion ripped from any number of crime procedural shows. Oh, it was the corrupt cop protecting her son for mother's love. While overall the movie unfolds its story in an engaging way as we solve the mystery along with David, feeling each new wrinkle as it deepens, it unfortunately is the story itself that turns out to not be quite worth the journey to get there. While searching doesn't quite stick the landing, the first hour or so is surprisingly intriguing and engaging, especially considering much of that time is literally looking at John Cho's face on a webcam while he Googles things. The fact that this can generate suspense or intrigue at all is pretty impressive. And with that, we have reached the conclusion conclusion of this ending explained for searching. Don't forget you can send me video requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me cover by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. I love hearing from you guys. What did you think of searching and its ending? Was the final outcome too ludicrous to you? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.